Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Rich. Very excited for today's show. We have Tom on from Secure It. And before we get into the show, I guess I should say Secure It Tactical Inc. But before we get into today's show, yeah, I got to talk about sponsors. And as folks are jumping on, please like and hit that share button. You definitely want to check out today's show. As you know, sponsors, we have some amazing sponsors like Mountain Man Medical. If you want to check out that uh, trauma kit that we're doing with Mountain Man Medical, please click on the link below and you can do that. We also have Century Martial Arts, maker of the Bob XL, which I use for my striking routines, shooting routines. I've even done some stabbing on Bob, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. It, it can kind of mess Bob up permanently. Cool Fire Trainer, guys, right now, you know the deal, man. It is so expensive with ammunition. Take that Cool Fire Trainer, and it can at least give your dry fire training, take it to the next level without spending a whole lot of money. We also have Precision Holsters Makers of the finest uh, holsters that I believe money can buy. They have a competition line. They have a tactical line. 100% money back guarantee. They're veteran owned. You know who they are if you've been watching this show for some time. Please click the links below. Get free shipping. Get a discount for being a loyal Watcher of Coffee with Rich and the American Warrior Show, America's number one self-defense podcast. Uh, I'd also like to thank Appalachian Stater, my good friend Jesse Ross over there, making some of the finest CBD products money can buy. And if you're like me and you're in your 50s and you're still doing jujitsu and you're rolling with these young guys, you know your joints are taking a pounding. I have found that the CBD products over there at Appalachian Stater have really helped me with that and helped me sleep as well, which is incredibly important for recovery. I'm going to read Tom's bio. Before I get going, we've got Tom, uh, Tony on here. Dan is on here. JD Helly up there in Rhode Island. God bless your brother. Coin number 1966. John Shriver out there in Yukon, Oklahoma. Please hit that share button. You're definitely going to want to check this out. Tom is the CEO and visionary leader behind Secure It Tactical Inc. Listed in Inc. 1. I'm sorry, 5,000 fastest growing private companies in America. He is the leading authority on military weapon storage and armory design. Secure is the largest supplier of weapon storage systems in the defense industry and is now the fastest growing residential gun safe company. Tom has designed custom armories for the U.S. Army Special Forces, Navy SEALs, and Marine Marshawk units. It was while working with the Army Special Forces that Tom developed Secure's patented cradle grid system. Uh, this revolutionary system that completely changed the way U.S. military stores its weapons, Secure It is bringing this technology to the consumer market, and I'm really looking forward to that. Secure It was grown out of Tom's previous data and electronics secure storage business when a law enforcement officer asked him to securely store an automatic weapon. Before his career as a storage expert and entrepreneur, Tom was a popular professional guitar player in Los Angeles. I'm really looking forward to talking about that for more than a decade. He currently resides in central New York with his family, where he is an active hunter, sports shooter, outdoorsman, and dynamic speaker on firearm safety, security, and home defense. Tom, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Exciting to be on the show. Yeah, Beautiful very, day here. Yeah, it is gorgeous up here on the plateau as well. I'm looking out the window here. <clears throat> yeah, let's see. I got... Uh, my American Warrior Show mug. I don't know if you guys can see that. If, if you want to pick one of these up, I got a list below. Check out some swag there. A uh, little shameless product placement, right, Tom? <laughs> Always. Uh, let's see. Will Parker is on out there in Montana. Will uh, Rhodes is on. Says, hey, Rich and Tom. Gerald is on out there in Oregon. Good morning, Gerald. Please like and share. We got an amazing show for you this morning. Tom, I read your bio, sir. What did that bio not cover? Um, but that, that was a pretty thorough bio. I'm listening, going, man, this thing is long bio. <laughs> um, no, that pretty much sums it up. You know, it's uh, I was a professional musician for many years. I had to I had to leave that profession for uh, health reasons. I developed tendonitis, and I couldn't play professionally anymore. I got into sales and started a company in my apartment in uh, Los Angeles, mm. in a really nasty little neighborhood, a little one room apartment, and we started a small business and grew it, and uh, Got into the internet in the late 90s, developing a website, taperack.com, selling computer storage tapes, then laptop storage cabinets, and then uh, a guy from the FBI calls and says, can you store an MP5? And I'm like, sure. What's an MP5? At that time, I didn't know what an MP5 was. And he explained it, and I laughed. I said, who are you? And he says, with the FBI. So we started looking at firearm storage. I was around 2000, 2001, and realized the military had a real problem. They were transitioning from the M16, which is a very standardized battle rifle, to the M4. 
Mm -hmm. which is modular. It's got, you know, everything about it is adjustable. You've got a lot of attachments, lots of things you can do with it. And all the storage the military had just really didn't work. So we started looking at firearms or weapons storage in the military. And uh, I worked with a Canadian company initially developing a system, which we then moved away from. Um, we got into a contract with U.S. Army Special Forces to tour all their armories. We spent about 18 months traveling to all their armories, touring them, spending time with the armors, really watching the workflow, seeing how they do what they do and why it wasn't working. And it was during that time that we developed cradle grid technology, which, you know, we use the term, the simplest tools solve the most problems. I always tell people, if you got a junk drawer in your kitchen, you got a pair of pliers, screwdriver, and some duct tape, because with the simplest tools, you can solve the most problems. And that's kind of how we approached the military weapon storage is how do we very simply solve this problem? And we came up with Cradle Grid, presented it to them, and they loved it. And in a matter of about five years, we went from a very small company to the largest supplier to the US military. Now, it is a very niche market. Um, and then five years ago, about four and a half, five years ago, we decided to bring the technology to the consumer market. And that was really driven by soldiers. We were in Little Creek or in, uh, Near Little Creek, it was at um, it was a trade show in uh, Virginia, and a lot of the SEAL guys were there, and they all were asking us, "Hey, I want a system like this for my house. Can you guys sell these for home use?" And our military system, I mean, people do buy it for their home, but it's really not designed for home use. And we made the decision we need to come up with um, storage solutions for the home. So that was kind of the start of that side of the business. The retail side of our business is now larger than the military side. Oh, really? This year. It is. It's well, the military, you know, COVID really shut down our military. I've got a contract right now to rebuild the armories for the Marine Corps in Okinawa. And that's been on hold for 18 months where we are just now loading containers and uh, getting ready to ship materials to Okinawa to get those army projects started. But it's been a, a real challenge. Have you been to Okinawa before? I have. I've been there several times. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I enjoy it. I've got, you know, we've got people there, so it's, I kind of get, I've got locals that I work with who know it well, so uh, I eat at good restaurants and stay at nice places. <laughs> Are you uh, mainly up at Kadena, uh, Okinawa City, or? I'm yeah. in Naha, is where Naha? I Naha? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was unfortunate enough to spend six months there, and I, it could have been a great tour if I, you know, but the Marine Corps has a way of making everything absolutely miserable, and uh <laughs> I don't know, Tom, I tell you, it, we were on air alert. I don't even know if they do that anymore. And <clears throat> we're on Camp Schwab, which is already a, kind of a miserable place. And then it's like, oh, if you want to even go to the bowling alley, you got to sign out and sign back in just to walk 100 yards. And it's like, my God, man, where am I going? But uh, yeah, that that's cool. They, they need some updating. I'm sure those armories there. Yeah, yeah it's a whole, we're, we're bringing a whole new, dimension to our cradle grid solution with this. this the, it's our weapon racks and cradle grid, but also we've got a lot of integrated gear storage um, with modular drawers. It's it's a pretty complex system, but for those guys, for their needs, it really is going to work well. It's going to be a game changer for them. Well, that's awesome. I, I'm really, really glad of that. And I'm really interested in, you know, when we had, um, you wouldn't think that civilians need that level of, uh, you know, to the standards of DOD. But when uh, Mike Seeklander and I and a couple others were standing up the United States Shooting Academy out there in Tulsa, because we were doing a lot of contracts with the U.S. military, the armory that we had there on site had to meet their standards. Mm -hmm. And this was probably, I don't know if you did that armory for us, because it was maybe 10 or 15, I guess 15 years ago plus at this point. Uh, I don't know if you were servicing DOD contracts at that time. Um, yeah, that was, that was early on for us. And we would have, uh, 15 years ago, we were still, we were still cutting our teeth. Okay. We yeah. Were taking our projects, but we were not the, you know, space saver was the major supplier at that point. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember who did that armor. They did a pretty good job. So, uh, you're, how did you get into guitar playing? I've been playing guitar since I was probably eight, nine years old. And, uh, in fact, coming through high school, that's, that's pretty much all I did. I didn't go to college. I played six, seven hours a day. Played in bands in the Northeast um, in 1984. I sent a demo tape in to a guy um, out in the West Coast who writes for Guitar Player Magazine, which was the big magazine at the time. 
and they did an article on me as one of the best unknown up and coming uh, heavy metal guitar players. And uh, after that, I got a lot of calls, a lot of things started happening. I moved to California, started playing, um, and I developed tendonitis in my forearms. I was practicing too much, and I just overdid it, and it got bad, and it got to a point where I just could not play professionally. I couldn't play long enough to actually do a show. So difficult couple of years. That's really all I knew. And uh, so I took a job telemarketing typewriter ribbons to businesses. <laughs> Um, it was, it was, it was a friend of mine said, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. You might want to check it out. And it was, uh, it was pretty funny. Um, hey, was, can you, was, can you imagine this, uh, Tom or, or anybody watching today? That's, that's roughly mine and Tom's age trying to explain to our kids what a typewriter ribbon is. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, what? Uh, but it was, uh, you know, businesses use thousands of these things. And, uh, I did that for about a year and a half. And then I started my own company with two friends in a, uh, just in a little apartment. Our offices were cardboard boxes. Oh, wow. And uh, we get up in the morning and uh, pull our boxes out and go to work. Um, I had hair at that time past my waist. I was a metalhead, so I still had the look. And, uh, you know, three years later, we had 20 employees and the company was, was in an office and, you know, was doing very well. That is cool. That is really cool. Um, so you, you br briefly talked about uh, how secure it got started, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, just like any entrepreneur, I'm imagining it's not a straight line, right? It's kind of a, you know, it's a kind of a meandering path or it has been for any business that I've helped start. It, it, it really has going into the military was, I mean, we were a dig our, our main business was selling computer tape racks and then laptop storage cabinets when the HIPAA laws came out. And we were the largest seller in the U.S., our little company of uh, tape storage and laptop storage. We were, we were growing like crazy. The weapon storage thing happened, and we just thought it was the coolest thing in the world and just kind of jumped into it. We designed our, our weapon storage system at the time, the initial design. We had never seen a military weapon rack. So we people say, wow, that's really outside of the box. And I always say, actually, we never had seen the box. We didn't know there was one. And it actually gave us an advantage because we didn't approach it from, here's a gun rack. How do we make it better? We approached it from, here's a gun. What's the best way to store it? And we, we actually went to Home Depot and walked the aisles looking at storage, just getting ideas. We called it Home Depot development. And our, our cradle grid system is compatible with a wide variety of storage products that anybody can buy at Home Depot. It's one of the reasons the military likes our what we do because the basic system holds the guns, we can get into that, um, properly holds all their weapons. But all the gear, everything else they've got to store and everything else in the consumer market, the volume of gear associated with firearms is growing exponentially. Our system also allows you to integrate gear with all the weapons. And that's a huge advantage. Well, and that's a great point you bring up uh, because I think uh, for civilians, you know, they think what, what's the problem, you know, it's you, you're storing a rifle, but again, it's a, you and I know it's not just that it's the optics. It's the lensatic compasses. It's the, the sight systems for mm -hmm. artillery or mortars. I mean, it's the plethora of things. It's a 240 yeah. golf cannot be stored in the same way that you store an M4. So, yeah, or, or a, a, a Modus 50 cal. Everything has to be somewhat different and a tailored system. And also, Tom, I want to touch on something you said, too, because it reminds me of uh, Gaston Glock, you know, when he was designing the Glock. He, he, I think he was a knife maker and he made some belts, maybe. And then all of a sudden he wants to go after this contract to design a pistol. So like you said, Tom, never been, never made a pistol before. So he didn't have his mind wasn't boxed in by what mm -hmm. a, how a, you know, a handgun should be. It could be anything he wanted it to be. So I, I like that innovative way that you approach that. Yeah, it's, I, I think there's an advantage when we design things now, it's always, no, 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 don't, don't show me what you've got. Tell me the problem. You know, it's let's, let's let people work on the problem before they see other solutions. Cause I think the minute you see something, it will forever, influence your uh, your thinking process. And, you know, that's one of the things in America that I see, especially with kids coming out of college right now, It's it's been going on for probably forever, but, you know, children are born 
100% creative. All they have is creativity. Everything they do is creative. You know, they always say kids say the darndest things. Well, it's because they have no filter. I mean, we laugh our heads off at some of the crazy things our kids when they were little said because they have no filter. But as kids grow up, they go to school and they know if they say something really goofy, they're going to get picked on. And the teachers will also, in, you know, you want to conform, you want to conform. By the time kids get out of high school or college, they've been taught how to conform. And, you know, I spend a lot of time with my staff trying to undo some of that and really get people to be creative because it's uh, one of our strongest assets as a company is we allow people the freedom to, to, to be as creative as they can be and really develop crazy out there solutions and then hone them, polish them, and kind of bring them back to like, wow, this could really be something. But some of the stuff we do starts off as really harebrained ideas. And uh, Heck, that can be some of the neatest things. And if you're just yeah. joining us this morning, uh, thank you to the 25 folks that are joining us live. Please like and hit that share button. We're just getting started. If you're wondering who I am, I'm Rich Brown, co-host and co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, and I'm joined by Tom today. He is the CEO and visionary leader behind Secure Tactical Inc. And I, one of the things that you said, Tom, I wanted to touch on real quick while folks are sharing the show is this idea that because I some of my business partners will say, uh, you know, I want to do this. I'm like, okay, I hear you, but what problem are we trying to solve here? Because you start putting things in place and it can really slow down and drag down a business. If we're not trying to solve a problem by, by creating this thing, then I'm not really interested in it. It has to have, sometimes we have a, a solution in search of a problem, right? And in reality, we need to focus on what is the problem and how do we solve it instead of just trying to throw something at just against the wall and see if it sticks. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You see that in a lot of products where they, Companies believe they have to be evolutionary. Their products have to change over time. And if <clears throat> if you've got a really good solution for a product, don't change it. Keep it. Let it. Let it roll. It's uh, there's a lot of over engineering. You see it. I see that. In, I see that in locking systems, in uh, in gun safes. Now the the over development of systems that they're to a point now where there's a whole lot of systems out there that I really think put people at risk. Because they, they they don't work very well, only because they're they're just the manufacturers are, are are thinking wrong. They're not they're not they're not thinking what is the problem we're trying to solve? What's the easiest way to solve it? Not the coolest. What's the easiest way for the consumer? And I think that gets missed quite often. Yeah, I think, uh, and I pro I know we're meandering this morning uh, for the for the viewer <laughs> out there, but I I think I think what Tom is talking about is it really incredible. Uh, in a very broader sense, but we can overdo it with, uh, you know, with jujitsu, like, you know, do I want to go to the advanced jujitsu class where I know we're going to work on nothing but leg locks? I'm not interested in that. That doesn't fit into my game as an older guy and how I view self-defense. I'm not interested in that, but so we can over-engineer things, even in like, I'm, I'm thinking gas cans these days. They over-engineer the crap out of these things, Tom. I don't know if you've seen <laughs> one lately. My it's God, it's a, it's ridiculous. We uh, that's really funny because my wife bought one recently, a new one for. Uh, um, we've got something that's two strokes. You want to have so we doing two stroke, and the I actually took it apart and disassembled the spout and actually made it because it was so engineered to try to prevent. I don't know if they're trying to prevent dripping. I don't know what it was, but it, it didn't work. And I actually took it all apart and fabricated a, a, a cap for it and said, "Here, honey, now just pop this off and pour gas like normal." Thank God. And, yeah, it's uh, it is so, funny. This quest for uh, you know, it's a they're they're trying to make products. I don't know, I don't use the term idiot proof, but the more they try it, the more they make the product the idiot. You know, that's it's, right. It's uh, you're making it more dangerous because, like you said, we're I'm having me and my kids. You know, we're trying to do all this stuff to the <laughs> to the gas container and really making it a lot. You know, very unsafe. Whereas before. Anyway, Bruce is joining us. He says, good morning, gentlemen. Coin number 481 up there in Michigan. Will says, I've never spilled so much gas uh, yet yeah, <laughs> until they started this weird stuff the way they're doing it now. But let's talk, Tom, tell me about how your relationship with DOD got started. Was it started prior to Secure It with, with your old storage business? Um, we did we did some some government work, not a lot. It really was the weapon storage size when we really started getting exposure and we were just kind of, you know, I say answering the mail. We were checking the bid boards, um, looking for projects, and then we would bid them. 
and we came across, um, it was a USAFIC at the time, which is now part of SOCOM, but it was US Army Special Forces Command, had armory problems and they were putting out a solicitation for a arms room assessment contract. This was the contract that we ended up winning it, but we traveled all over and that's where we really became experts. At the time, we were a three person company and we were up against some big global defense contractors. And we're going in to meet with these guys. And we looked at the specs of putting a proposal together, which we had never done any of this before. And you were kind of like, you know, are our shirts white enough? Are tie, do we have the right tie? You know, we, did, we had no idea what we were doing. But we sat down with them and explained what we could do. And our quote came in quite a bit less than anybody else because we just we didn't have overhead. It was simple. We won that contract. Um, I'm going to say we BSed our way into it. We Nobody was an expert. There, nobody knew this stuff. And so we came in and just said, you know, we're the leading authority. I said, I'm the leading authority on small arms storage. Nobody could dispute it. I mean, maybe I was. <laughs> Who knows? It was my opinion. But we won that contract. And, you know, we were as shocked as anybody that we won it. But it was during that next 18 months that we really did buckle down. Um, did a lot of travel, spent a lot of time, and really focused on these guys and didn't come in pitching a solution. We came into these armories and just talked to these armories and said, what, do you, what is it you do? What is it you hate doing? What's your biggest pain in the ass? What's the, you know, what doesn't work right now? What, I mean, a lot of the armories were an absolute mess. You, people have been shocked to see how bad some of these, this is armies, you know, elite fighting forces, and their armories were really bad. Um, so we became the pros from Dover during that contract. And then uh, we developed the cradle grid system, which is the simplest solution we could do, incorporating bins and components that you can get from Home Depot. We came in and presented it, and we we're like, they're either going to like it or they're going to kick us out no matter. You know? <laughs> and they absolutely loved it they, the, because of the simplicity. And it's one moving part. Our cradle grid solution in the military going from a – M4 and MP5 up to a 50 cal or even shoulder launch systems, it's one moving part, our upper cradle. And that one piece is engineered so it holds a barrel, holds a magwell, holds a foregrip, 50 cal barrels, the, the modus receiver. It can hold all these guns. So when an armorer walks into an armory, comes up to a rack, he can grab that saddle, adjust it real time, place the gun in the system, and it, it is stored. Next gun, same thing. It adjusts on the fly. So there's not this, you know, at that time to, to change guns in Iraq, you need screwdrivers and you're moving components around. And nobody does that. You know, in the military, an armor is not going to take something apart. He's just going to kind of make do. And they end up with their weapon racks looking like bird's nests. Our system, you know, in Marsoc in, the, in uh, Pendleton, they called it the Tetris rack. The guys would start at the bottom and just start building. And then uh, on the East Coast, I think it was third group, they called it the Lego rack. You know, the guys like building Legos. It's a building block. And when you look at the consumer, now we look at the civilian market, same challenges. Guys are getting a lot more AR platform weapons. Everybody's shooting with optics now. Guns are becoming more modular. And there's a, such a wide variety of platforms and, and, and nomenclatures. There's things are so diverse. Our system still works. It's one adjustable, very simple piece that will hold any of these firearms in a manner. You know, our points are guns are stored in one row. You never store guns like in a traditional gun safe. They're really deep and you're packing all these guns in there. Well, that's a really that's a real mistake. Um, we bring a military mindset. All guns are stored in one row. So you can open the door with one hand, remove a firearm with the other, close the door. You're never laying guns on the ground. You're never digging through stuff. All guns are stored free and clear. No two guns are ever touching. We have room for optics up to a five inch thermal imaging scope. You know, if a Marine sniper goes into combat, his rifle has to perform perfectly. It has to remain zeroed. He's got one shot, he has to make it. Our system guarantees that because of the way we store the firearms. And, you know, consumers want the same thing. The, the civilian market, they want the same thing. People are spending. You know, it's not unusual to spend three or four thousand dollars on an optic. If you've got a precision rifle, by the time you're all said and done, um, you can get seven to fifteen thousand dollars into a rifle. Well, to stick it into a traditional gun safe is crazy. 
in our opinion, we can get into the, there's a lot of other issues with gun safes, but our system stores it in the same manner, identical how the military stores it, and it's just simple and it works. Weapon is stored clear, and you've got very fast access. Everything we do, all of our cabinets are considered fast access storage um, because guns, if you're going to lock guns in your home, lock them in a manner that gives you an advantage in the event of a crisis. You know, don't put them away so you can never get to them. Exactly. Now, do you do much work in, say, Australia or South Africa or anywhere like that? We've done some work in Australia. We've done, uh, in the Middle East, we've done quite a bit of work. Um, we did some work in Nigeria years ago. I've not been, we've done a lot of quotes in South Africa. Um, we've never, a lot of those parts of the country, they come to us, we do quoting, but it's very difficult for them to actually spend money. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, there's like always quotes that sit for years, they, you know, tenders out there and nothing, they end up disappearing. Um, we just, a couple of years ago, we did the Kuwaiti army. Um, I spent some time, spent about 10 days there. Well, that's a, that's, that's, that's a place I don't need to go back to. <laughs> no, I don't want to go back to Kuwait either. No. I, I was, the reason I ask, I, places like Australia, probably New Zealand, I would imagine South Africa, where you cannot have a gun in your house unless you have, you know, a, a really solid storage system. And I think, you know, the police officer will come to your house. I think they do this in the UK and Northern Ireland. They, they check off the safe before the gun can ever come there. Uh, so that might, I mean, that would seem like a great market because of course here in America, you can just chuck them under your bed and nobody, nobody's cares. Yeah, it's, we're trying to change that. One of the challenges is gun safes just don't, traditional gun safes just don't work very well. They were designed back in the 1960s to really meet a 1960s threat level and to store 1960s guns, which is a, you know, a side-by-side -side over under shotgun and a lever action rifle or a simple bolt gun with iron sights. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at my my safe right here next to me, and I'm I'm Tom. Everything you're saying is so true. <laughs> well, it's they're completely static. They're not. Remember, it's interesting when we first went into the consumer market. Our first thought was, we're a defense contractor. Let's partner with a safe manufacturer. So I spent and we spent it was over a year doing research, and I went and I met with senior leadership team at um, some of America's largest safe manufacturers and really spent a lot of time with them trying to learn. And you, you meet the executive team and you get the, you get the sales varnish, you know, polished talk. Then you get the plant tour from a plant manager or just one of the regular guys there. And those are the guys that really tell you what's going on. And I walk with these guys, I'm asking a lot of questions and gun safes are designed to look good empty. This is one of my, this is one of the things that we learned is when they design the interior of a gun safe, remember gun safes are sold empty. That's they right. want us to open the door at like Bass Pro or some gun distributor, some gun dealer, gun safe dealer. That safe is really impressive looking. They'll light it up and it's just leather, little W's, all the little stuff in there. It looks really good. When you fill a gun safe, if you, you'll never get the capacity, they say. You won't even get halfway there. But when you fill it full of guns, it looks awful. They're just packed. It's a mess. The, there's no respect for the firearm. One of our statements is always respect doesn't end when you close the door and our safes don't look good empty they're not designed to look good empty. they're designed to hold guns and one of the challenges early on we started selling we we're selling through bass pro we we're selling through some of the big distributors and the products weren't selling real well because in a store if they don't know our product they don't know what this actually is empty sitting there next to a safe it's pretty unimpressive and they can't put guns in it in a store. They just, they, they, they can't do it that way. We'd go to trade shows, like we're at SHOT Show. We've got all of our cabinets and everything we've got is maxed out with firearms. Our booth is packed. People have never seen anything like it. Gun safe booths, all the safes are empty. They can't put guns in them because they actually don't fit very well. And that was at that point we realized we need to be a direct-to-consumer company where people can come to our website and we have to have the opportunity to actually, they can look at it, you know, through video, through ph photography, say, this is what the system is. This is how it works. And when we made that change, that's when the sales retail side really started taking off. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, Tony has a question. He says, I'm a 07 FFL. Do you have storage that's comparable price wise and fire rating that's currently on the market? Um, yes and no. 
we don't do a fire rating. You don't need a fire rating. And the gun safe you have with a fire rating, I'm going to say is 100% BS. We can talk a little bit about fire ratings if you want, because the fire sure. ratings on gun safes is 100% nonsense. And I, you know, I, I've ticked off a lot of people going down this path sometimes. I don't mean to, but it's the cold slap of reality. And this is what I learned. This is what happened. I went to China. I met with two safe manufacturers. This was early on part of our research. I said, if we're going to make a safe, most safes in America are made in China. So I went there and I met with two of the largest manufacturers. I'm speaking with the rep and he's got all these safes coming out there. I think there were stack ons and there was a Patriot, which was an early Liberty line that they no longer make. And there's hundreds of them coming off this line. They all get this 60 minute rating the stickers going on fire rating. So I'm thinking, I'm talking to the guy. I said, if we're going to do a safe, we want it to be different. I want it to be better. So I said, could you make a 90 minute safe? He goes, oh, absolutely. I go, could you make a 120? He goes, whatever you want. I just would we'll just print the sticker and stick it out. I just think about that. And I, so I, and I said, so you just changed it? Yeah, I can do a sticker, whatever you want. I said, I asked him, do you do any testing? How do you know this is 60? And through translation, it was a struggle to get to them to understand my question. And we finally got to them. And they're like, no, we, we make this for the Americans, and they want this sticker on it. There is no testing. In the U.S. world, you'll see independently tested, 60-minute fire rating. So we did some research on that. Gun safe manufacturer builds a safe, they design a test, they hire another company to do their test. They pass their test because they know they can, independently test it. So a fire rating test, safe goes into an oven, there's temperature probes in the safe. Oven's brought up to 1300, for whatever the sticker says, you know, one hour, 1400 degrees. And it sits there and they cook it off. And they go one hour and those probes have not broken 350 degrees. That safe passes the test. Boom. Well, the reality of fire. Inside a fire in your home, a raging fire is what we're talking about. The air is moving in excess of 60 miles an hour. It can be, it's just a roaring torrent of craziness. So I want you to think about this. Put your oven to 500 degrees. Now, this, we're talking 1,000. But at 500 degrees, put your hand in an oven when you're baking a pizza. You can hold your hand in that oven for probably five minutes. It's going to slowly get hotter. Now put your hand in front of a jet engine blowing exhaust at 500 degrees at 60 miles an hour. Your hand will be third degree burns in seconds. It's the same thing with a safe. In an actual raging fire, a safe is going to go five, 10 minutes, no more. And it is, if you Google, anybody Googles California wildfires gun safes. About four years ago, they had those horrible fires that went through Central California. There's several articles about gun collections being lost in, in every instance. There's not a case where a gun safe survived, and they can't. Um, we developed our True Safe, which is sold through Safe and Vault now. We actually OEM'd it to them. Um, it's such a heavy safe. It's kind of outside of our what we do. But we, we did design it. It's still being produced. And that's a double-walled steel safe filled with cement. It's a cement composite. That is a true fire safe, but it weighs so much, it's just not manageable. But you need that cement fill. The gun safes that we all use, that people buy, are single layer steel and drywall. It's, 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 it's BS. It's just not a real fire rating. But the other side of this is, you don't need a fire rating. If you look at actual fire data, and uh, we've written about it, we've looked in depth, the fire insurance industry drives this they are the ones that supply all the data. They pay the claims. Almost all fire insurance claims are smoke related. If you look at fires, 90, I don't know, it's 93, 94% of all fires occur within the kitchen and are contained within a pot or within the oven. It's smoke damage. When you look at actual heat damage claims, almost all of them are carelessness or smoking, candles, and it's usually confined to a corner of a room. Um, if you live in a city with a professional firefighting force, response time is usually under five minutes. I live in a small town volunteer firefighting force. Response time to my house is 11 minutes. You can call your insurance company and ask them, what's the response time to my house? They know because that's how they rate your policy. They know the exact amount of time it takes to get to your house. So could a house burn to the ground? Yes. But every year it happens less and less. America is becoming much safer. A hundred years ago, fire was a real risk. 
there really isn't anymore. Now, also though, with a big traditional gun safe, all your guns are stored in one place. If the fire occurs right there and it gets hot, you're done. We teach and we, we promote the concept of decentralized storage. Our storage units, and we brought this in the military, are smaller and modular. We don't make a huge, great, big vault that all your stuff goes into. We make small, modular, lightweight safes that allow you to store and secure guns throughout your home. If you should have a fire and it's going to be confined to one room, it's not going to get to your gun. So it might get to one or two, but you're not going to lose your collection. And also, it's much safer from a security standpoint and from a home defense standpoint to store your guns in multiple locations. Yeah, that's that's a solid information. I agree with Elkie, who says, you know, excellent info. And I, I will add on some gravitas to what you're saying there, Tom, in that when I was with the American Red Cross as the you know regional manager for disaster preparedness, we managed disaster assistance teams throughout the state and they would respond to all home fires. And I absolutely saw what you're saying. Most of them were contained within the kitchen where they started. They never got, rarely got to those back bedrooms where the, the safes were. So, you know, you could spend all this money to get a perfect fire rating that was real and a concrete safe. And you, you know, you bolt it to your slab foundation, et cetera, et cetera. And you just don't necessarily need that. Uh, th that's great. No, you don't. And it's uh there's a lot about the safe industry that's the, the world is changing. The gun safe industry isn't. And if you look at the rating on the safe, the class rating, you know, UL is Underwriters Laboratory was created by the insurance industry in the late 1800s to assess risk. Electricity was new and coming to homes. Fire was a risk. So UL was created to standardize the ratings on electrical components to make sure things were safe for homes. Well, the safe industry also uses UL to rate safes. So that like a jewelry store that's or millions of dollars in diamonds can get insurance policy and they look at the class rating of the safe to rate that policy for storing those valuables. Well, UL has a rating for gun safes. It was created in the 70s. It's called Class RSC. And anybody with a gun safe, look inside your door, it'll say UL Class RSC. RSC stands for Residential Security Container. The word safe is not part of the class. UL would not allow the use of the word safe because these units do not meet the minimum standard to even be called a safe. It's one layer of steel and drywall. The class, the actual class, what you're protecting, what you're rated for is blocks five minute access from one person with a pry bar of less than 18 inches, a hammer of less than five pounds, and a small hand drill. That is a 1960 threat level. Fast forward to today, I'm going to walk in your house if I'm a thief with a DeWalt 20-volt cordless saw. It's going to have a steel carbide blade. These blades are designed to be used in um, concrete work, job sites, to cut rebar up to half-inch thick. It cuts through half-inch rebar like water. It does it all day long. I'm going to walk up to your safe. I'm going to cut your safe in half. Uh, we've got a video. I cut a Liberty Fat Boy Jr. It's their number one. It's a big safe, 36-gun safe. I walked around it with an old skill saw, a 1980s skill saw, but one of these modern blades. It was a minute, 18 seconds. I cut it completely in half. Then I took just a test. I did a 12 by 12 hole in the side of the safe. It was under 20 seconds. The, the notion that these big safes, because they weigh a lot, are somehow secure is a complete myth. If, if you read the brochure, it'll focus all your attention on the door, the bolts, plate steel, the lock, all this stuff for security. If I'm a professional thief, I ignore the door. That's where the security is. I simply cut the side open. And modern saws rip through these safes like butter. And you're not going to stop it. Even going a quarter inch plate only slows me down a little bit. Now, we make lightweight gun safes. Can a saw cut through my safe? It can. But our safes and our system, if you looked at my home, you'd never see a safe. I've got two firearms in a master bedroom. I've got eight firearms in a front hall closet, kitchen pantry. I've got eight firearms. I mean, they're located throughout the home, you know, in a way that where thieves don't go and where I need them in the event of a crisis. Um, I can go through it real quick. FBI crime data. Thief breaks into your home. He's going master bathroom. It's the first place they go looking for drugs. 
something they can sell. Master bathroom, master bedroom, valuables, home office den, possibly dining room, and then they're out of the house. In less than 10 minutes, most break-ins occur during the day. So when you look at firearm storage, a big safe sitting next to a fireplace in your den is crazy. You're advertising, you know, as what the brochure shows, but you're advertising, hey, here's all my stuff. So we look at it, master bedroom, least secure room in your home, but that's where you sleep. One or two firearms in a small fast access safe. Kitchen, people spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Thieves ignore kitchens. If you've got a big pantry, I've got a agile cabinet in there. I've got, now I've got part of my collection in there of you know lever actions, other guns, but I've also got an AR-15 magazine in the well, ready to roll. Front hall closet, coat closet, I've got a small cabinet in there. I've got, again, part of my collection. I've also got a pump shotgun, a Mossberg 500 with rounds in the tube, and I've got an AR-15 that is fully ready to roll. Then I've got small, fast access handgun safe. It's not a very secure room. Um, guest bedroom, walk in my house, end of a hallway, made bed, nightstand with a lamp, piece of generic art in the wall, and the room is empty. In that closet, I've got 24, I've got a big, system of cabinets. I've got 24 rifles stored in there. Thieves ignore these rooms if they're running a house. They're going to open the door, say guest bedroom. They're not going to spend any time. In the event of a break-in when we're home, that room becomes a safe room. It's at the end of a hallway. We go to that room. We're armed. And anybody who wants to get to us has to come through a constriction point. It has to come down that hallway. They're never going to make it. They're not going to try. But there's a lot of information on our website about decentralized storage and this idea that Turn your home into a defendable fortress. If you're going to store firearms, don't put them all in one place. You know, the military learned that after 9-11, we, we built some massive armories early on um, in the D.C. area for like, mobile diplomatic security and some of these groups. And then we broke them all up. And they realized that in a true crisis, the roads are full. So they actually, you know, strip malls all around major cities, there's small little offices with armories for security force guys that they can get there and they can get to any one of these armories and, and get themselves armed and get the gear they need. It's the same type of principle of break it up, spread it around so that A, thieves don't find it, and B, you're never more than two or three seconds away from arming yourself. I love it. I love it, Tom. That's a solid information for, for folks listening today. Hey, please, let me throw real quick. If people want to come to us online, Secure Gun Storage is our consumer products website. There's also, I saw some posts and notes in the comments on securetactical.com. That is our military site, and that is really designed for military guys to come and get an idea what they want. There's no problem. It's just we do quotes and stuff. But for the consumer market, all the information is securetgunstorage.com. And where is the, can they find these videos online of you cutting safes apart? Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, our YouTube, YouTube channel. Or... Yeah, if you just Google Secure It, we, I mean, we come up all over the place. We've got a pretty busy and an active YouTube channel. And I do have a link in today's show notes to your YouTube channel. So if if, if that's where uh, you want to check that, the easiest thing, I already got you covered. It's in the sh show notes today. So uh, you bring up some interesting points, Tom. I want to I want to dig into a little bit more. So you told us fire ratings are kind of bunk. Um, so when someone is evaluating whether this is the right gun safe for them, what are some of the criteria they should be using? Um, well, for, for us, it's very simple is, does it properly store all my firearms? And they have to look at their, if you've got a M4 AR-15 collapsible stock, shorter barrel, and you've got a Versamax uh, duck gun, you know, one is going to be, you know, 23 inches, the other one's going to be 46 inches. Is a gun safe going to hold those properly? It probably won't. Um, I look at the materials inside the safe. You know, it's, it's for me, the question is very simple. You know, you, use our system because it's simple, it's affordable, and it's completely adjustable. Um, if you've got all your guns are the same length, if you shoot, if you had a whole big collection of lever action guns, they'll fit in a regular safe. You won't get to them quickly. I mean, you're not, you're not, these are not going to be used for home defense because a gun safe takes a long time to open. Um, all of our safes are what we consider fast access, simple programmable push button locks. We don't use fingerprint readers. And I encourage all your readers, if you're, if you've got a safe or a fast access safe for a defensive firearm, 
I would avoid the fingerprint readers look sexy. They're, they're promoted. It's all cool. But we consider this never fail technology. This is a fast access safe for home defense is a never fail piece. Meaning if somebody's in your home shooting at you, you need to be armed. You've got seconds or less. Um, a fingerprint reader, if your hands are wet, it won't open. If your hands are dirty, it won't open. If you've got gloves on, it won't open. If you cut your finger, it won't open. There's a lot of reasons these won't open. They're designed to say no until you get the perfect read. We use a very simple push button system. You program your own lock. Like with our fast box goes under your bed, part of our instructions, you mount it under your bed. You got your shotgun or AR-15 in there or handguns in there. And every night before you go to bed in the dark, you reach down, do the lock open it and then close it. You do that every day for about 35 days, then do it once a week. What you're doing is you're building muscle memory. You're training yourself to very calmly and quickly, you know that combination by touch and you can open it. You know, when we look at home defense and we look, talk to people with firearms, a lot of people go to the range, they take a lot of classes and they practice and become very proficient with firearms for home defense. And there's a lot of aspects to this. I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not a, a firearms expert. I'm a storage expert. I don't need to get into that, but you've done all that and, not, and you're really good at it. But part of that same defense strategy that's in, is access. All guns need to be locked and secured. And that's, that's our position is all guns should be locked, keeps you safer. Yet you want one to two second access. Well, that requires training and practice too. So if you're going to take all this time, but also, every time I go to my front hall closet, I'm grabbing a jacket, I reach down and do that combination, open the door, and I close it. Because I know if somebody's trying to kick in my front door, I'll have a firearm out of that safe in less than two seconds because I practice it all the time. So, you know, we, we, that's some of the stuff that we teach within our website. We talk about it, and it's right within our printed instructions. Well, you bring up some excellent points, not just about the safe storage of firearms, but general home defense. I, I want to ask you, Tom, what do most armed citizens not fully understand or fully comprehend about some of the rules of the road when it comes to home defense? Um, well, I, I, I'm going to say I'm not a home defense expert. I'm a storage expert. But some of the things that I see that just kind of drive me a little bit nuts is the statement of I'm just going to get a shotgun with a buckshot or birdshot because I don't want to have to aim. I'm just going to I just want to point and shoot and take out the threat. Well, in a home, I always tell people, if, you, if, the, if the gun's under your bed, measure the distance to, your, to the door of your bedroom. That's where your threat's going to be. Go to the range, set up a target that distance, and shoot it. How big is the pattern? Well, it's the size of a dime. Guess what? you got to aim. You know, it's in close quarters, in a home. You don't. This concept that a shotgun is going to spread out and somehow make it so you don't have to aim is just wrong. You know, I use an AR-15, either that or a shotgun. I have a red dot. Um, I like the AR-15 platform because there's no recoil. I got multiple shots on target. There's, for a lot of reasons, it's easier to move to move with. Um, I'm not a big handgun guy. That's just that's just me. I'm a rifle guy. That's just what I prefer. Um, but there's that aspect of, you know, train like you fight. If you want to be good at home defense, set up scenarios when you're at the range that mimic your home, the distances, the movement, where you're going to be, and set up drills that are closer. A lot, you know, every I go to the range and everybody's shooting 100 yards. People like to go out longer distance, shoot handguns, you know, training them 100, 200. I said, but if you're going to, I mean, it's fun to go plinking and shooting, but there's also a training aspect. And if you are training, set up those scenarios and practice those as well. Yeah, Tony down in Georgia, is, he says, anyone who shot three-gun knows how easy it is to miss with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. I will, as a former three-gunner, I will echo that uh, sentiment. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you, you know, getting mm -hmm. off topic, I know this may not fall in line with uh, your, you know, the things that you're a subject matter expert on, Tom, but just as an armed American, with the rise of mass shootings that we've seen, man, is is gun control the answer? And if if not, what is? Um. Gun control is, I mean, it's, no, it's not the answer. It's, and it's, it's the political answer because the politician holds up this big black AR-15 and say, this is the problem, and I'm going to make this problem go away because they don't want to address what the actual problem is. And it's interesting. I did a lot of research on this years ago, and this has changed over years with mass shootings. If you look at early mass shootings, there are no mass shootings 
prior to the 1980s. There actually, there's the Texas A&M shooter, but that doesn't fit the profile. That was a guy's sniper at pretty good distance. But prior to the 80s, there's no mass shootings. And then we start having them, Columbine and these, and these incidents. And when you start looking from 1980 up to 2000, and you encourage your readers, do some research. The data's out there, and you look at the shooters. What do they have in common? Well, one of the commonalities is they're on an antidepressant drug. Now, psychotropic drugs used for treating bipolar, antidepressant, they came out in the late 70s. 70s that's when they were developed. There's no mass shootings till these drugs come out. They come out, and then coming from the early 80s going forward, going to about 2000, when you look at mass shootings, in every instance I looked at, the shooter was either on one of these drugs or had gone off at cold turkey, which they, which any psychologist, psychiatrist will tell you, you absolutely don't do that. Now, that poses some difficult questions. These drugs are lifesavers for millions of people. It's my opinion that in very rare instances, they also can create monsters. And it's probably a controversial statement, but I look at data. I run a business based on data, not based on opinions or whims. And that data is out there. You can do the research. I encourage everybody to do their own research. Don't, don't go to the news for, you can't look at the media for accurate information anymore. Do your own research. The data is there. But a politician doesn't want to address that because tackling health, mental health is political suicide. So it doesn't get tackled. But pointing to a big black gun saying, this thing is the problem, politically, that's easy. It's easy to do. But it's not. The, I mean, AR-15 is a gun they're after. Um, average, you know, America sees 12 to 15,000 gun deaths a year. Of those, the bulk are suicide. Um, uh, after that, the bulk is handgun. AR-15 total deaths. The so last year I looked, and it was several years ago, it was 86 deaths. Of those, half of them were suicide. Of the remaining 45, a chunk of those were accidental discharge. It's the least used gun in crime. It's too big. <laughs> Yet, but politically, hey, let's go after this. You know, from a home defense standpoint, there is no better firearm than an AR-15. It's and, they're, you know, like you said, they're they're black, they're scary, they look mm -hmm. like something you see on a movie where they're hurting people. Oh. It's, it's an easy thing to do. And like you said, you know, with these uh, SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, whatever they are, that like you said, when you get off of them, they're very dangerous. I, and I've, I've, so we've said it on this show many times. It's not a gun problem so much as it's a mental health crisis disguised as a gun problem. And these, and I'm not crapping on these drugs. These drugs are amazing. I know that you know a lot of people that I care deeply about have taken these drugs that during crises in their life. And they have really been helpful. But like you said, Tom, in certain people uh, use certain ways, uh, they, they don't work and, and they can be dangerous. So I, I'm glad you said that. And Mark uh, says it's most likely a mental health. Terry has posted a link to um, your podcast and stuff on YouTube. So thank you very much for that, Terry. Um, what, the, another question I had for you, Tom, given your background, let's talk about what can the average American do to make themselves harder to kill? And it's a question that I ask most of our guests on the show, and I'm always interested in what, what your thoughts are. Um, you know, my, I, I, again, everything we do, you walk in my company, the first thing you see is a big sign that says innovate and simplify. Anybody can divide, design something complex. Making it simple is a challenge. It was... Um, who was a was famous writer said, I would have written a shorter letter if I'd had more time. <laughs> Simplifying things takes time. And I look at home defense and home defense strategies, and I, I look at simple, and it's not sexy, but um, lighting the front of your house, removing remo moving bushes and plants away from the front of your house, giving yourself a, a channel, you know, harden your home, the outside of your home, a camera at the door. Remember, Bad guys aren't looking for a fight. They're looking for they're looking for a lamb. They're looking to, for a pushover. They're looking to just to get. The, they want it to be easy, and it's no different than a bully in a school. You don't need to be the toughest kid in the school. You just don't want to be the <laughs> the weakest. Or if a bear's chasing five people, you don't need to be the fastest. Just don't be the slowest. The same thing. Harden your home. It starts with you know motion activated lighting, right there, and. Uh, 
keep in the front of your house clear right there will 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 do amazing things um, if you've got firearms for home defense um, all the data that we look at if your firearms are unsecured you are at greater risk um, that's that's the data I'm not, going, I'm not going to go into all the nuance of that but if you have firearms they need to be secured in our opinion they should be locked out of sight we would never recommend a trigger lock or anything like that. It's far too slow if there's any chance of children being in the home, you want guns locked in a manner where they're not visible. But that's still, it doesn't mean you can't get to them. All of our systems are very fast access. And then we locate them, you know, again, look at your home. If you're gonna own firearms, practice, train, stay proficient, and store the firearm in a method that, that, that puts you at an advantage. We saw record gun sales, first time buyers. My, my belief is that a lot of these people, they go out, they get the training, the classes, they're excited, it's new, they're going to the range. We're going to flash forward five years from now, and you're going to have a record number of people who have a firearm that's in a box somewhere. It's in a closet. It's somewhere in their home. They're not sure where it is anymore. They haven't been to the range in two years. They, 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 they've got ammo. They're not sure how much they have or where it is because – that, that, that fear factor has dissipated and they've gone back to their old way of being. The minute you purchase your first firearm, your life should, should change forever. You are now a firearms owner and that responsibility doesn't go away. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's the guys who train the most are the, are the guys who are the best prepared. Our, our military wins because nobody trains more than our military. Our fire departments are good because these guys are training. Police, they all, they train, train, train. It's, it's the same thing for consumers, I think. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Tom. Uh, I know that, you know, when, whether it was at the United States Shooting Academy or with our company, American Warrior Society, you know, we try to design our, um, our training that's on the website for the guy or gal that mm -hmm. – when Obama got elected, they ran out and bought an AR-15 and and it's still in the box, you know, yep. shoved underneath their bed. And it's like, no, you need to get that. Let us show you how to run that system that you bought. Let it. But one of the things we don't do, and which well, I'm so glad you're on here, is how do you secure that? And maybe that's something that we need to do a video on is how to secure that firearm. Because while we teach the use of it, we do not teach the storage of it. But I think it is incredibly important, especially with little ones in the home. Or, yeah. or like you said, the, uh, you know, the ability to get quick access to it. Yeah. It's, um, one of the top things stolen from homes during break-ins is firearms. It's one, it's one of the top, one of the top things on the list because so many firearms in America are not secured. They're in a box or up on a shelf. And, uh, you know, we, as, as gun owners, you know, I would say if every gun in America was properly secured, how many tragedies would be avoided? Would we even be fighting for our Second Amendment rights? You look at um, Lanza. You know, he shot up all those kids. He walked into his mom's house. He was snapped. He, something went wrong. He walked into his mom's house, picked up her AR-15, and shot her with it before she could do anything. If her guns had been properly secured, he would have walked in, freaked out, wouldn't have access. His mom now had the opportunity to defuse him, to get him off the cliff or whatever was going on, to get authorities there. She would have had time. There's no guarantee that it would have made a difference. But having the unsecured firearm set that set the motion, set that whole chain of events in place. And uh, yeah, and it's you know the, the I like the chain metaphor because as as anyone that's studied you know accidents. You break any link in that chain and it doesn't happen. Yeah. So like you said, if that gun would have just been secured, he still might have stabbed his mom or something like that because, you know, he was in a mental health crisis or yeah. what, whatever was going on. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't averted everything, oh. but the level of tragedy that he was able to inflict at Sandy Hook would have probably never have happened. Yeah, it's uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of instances like that where if the firearms had been secured, it, it allowed people some time, some time with this prior to the tragedy starting. Again, no guarantee of a positive outcome, but unsecured, you're guaranteed of a negative one. Uh, That's right. So it's, and, you know, now go ahead, Tom. Respect for firearms. And part of that responsibility and that respect is you've got to have them secured. And respect doesn't end when you close that door. Store them properly. Store them in locations that make sense. Give yourself the advantage and practice, practice, practice.
Tom, I've had you on here for almost an hour, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I do have one more question if you have time yeah. for it. Sure. You know, I, and, and again, this is one of those questions that I kind of a catch-all I like to ask everybody that, yeah. I, that I'm fortunate enough to have on the show, and that is, what are your thoughts or perhaps concerns regarding the new administration, pandemic response, the economy? Take it wherever you want it, but as far as the coming weeks, months, and even perhaps years, what are some of your concerns, Tom? Um. Well, first, the first simplest one is, are we creating lemmings? How long do we keep going along with this BS? Because the data now, all the actual data, forget the politics of it. You don't need, if you're vaccinated, don't wear a mask. Now, if you're an anti-vaxxer, I'm not going to get into that debate. That's, that's a personal choice. I'm going to respect anybody. But it's been proven to me through data that wearing masks is no longer necessary. I'm going to get pushback on it, but I think it's dehumanizing. I wouldn't do it. I think this giving all this money to people who are not working, this bonus, unemployment, and everything is a colossal mistake. I have so many friends in restaurant industries and small business that can't get workers because people aren't going to work because they're making, they make more money working, but they're getting enough. And they're not working. I've got, I know people personally who aren't going back to work because they don't have to. And pumping all this money, all this stimulus, all this stuff they're doing, my opinion is we're going to see inflation and it's, it could get bad. And uh, I don't think it'll be long term. I think it's going to be shorter term. But um, this administration is out of touch. I mean, I said, you know, it's, it's, I feel bad for Joe Biden. I think he was pressured into this. Um, he's just like a uh, like an old uncle or an old grandfather who's just not all there, being propped up and told what to do. And uh, he should be sitting on a porch, sipping a drink, playing with his grandkids, and uh, not be in that position of the most powerful person in the world because I don't believe he's all there. I think he's suffering cognitively. I think his age is getting to him. I'm not sure who's running the country. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, in three years from now, three and a half years from now, we, 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 it's going to be a very different story. I think in two years, in the, the midterm elections can be a game changer for this country. Um, but I, I, I hope people realize what's happening and they wise up and they start thinking that, you know, that our government is not there to make us okay. Our government is not there to make us happy. Our government is not there to make us successful to do any our government is there to provide basic security organize of commerce and keep our borders secure and we as americans pursue happiness the, we pursue what we want to do i started life with nothing in a one-room apartment in a bad neighborhood where cops are everywhere drugs everywhere gunfire sometimes i started from nowhere with nothing and i built a pretty successful organization anybody can do that now i was there's such a racial, I didn't get it right, but this is a racial divide in America. It's all bullshit. It's, it's crap. When you look at, I always tell people the story. They don't know is who's the first self-made millionaire, female millionaire in American history. The first self-made female millionaire. It was an African-American woman. It is. And I, th I think in the 19th century, if I remember. Sarah correctly. Breedlove. Yeah. She was a slave. She got her freedom during the Emancipation Proclamation, started a company of hair care products for African-American women, became a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, moved to New York, became a philanthropist. Now, she is someone who started truly from nothing, not even freedom, at a time when there was institutional racism. And she became the first self-made millionaire, female millionaire in American history. Racism is not what keeps people down. But what's happening right now in America politically, I think there is a push to try to keep people down, to divide us. There's this big thing, keep dividing, keep dividing, keep systemic this, critical race here. The politicians want to divide and conquer America by cutting up into little pieces. I travel all over the country, and one common thing I always see is when somebody's in trouble, the guy next to them helps. Doesn't matter what race they are, what gender they are. When somebody stumbles and falls, the person next to them helps them. I see it everywhere because we, as people, we're not racist. We all get along. We 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 all want, we all want ourselves and our neighbors to to prosper. We work together, and I think it's the government and the media that is working to drive this country apart. We just can't let it happen. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%, Tom. You know, the last year um, we canceled classes and didn't didn't travel and train uh, as much, you know, when COVID first started. And then uh, Mike and I started going out and training. And I tell you, the first time we traveled somewhere to teach something, he and I, when we met at the hotel room later that night, we're like, man, I, th- I thought I was going to run into everything I've been seeing on TV, but everybody's just as friendly, mm-hmm. just as engaging, just as warm as they've ever been. America isn't necessarily what you see on TV. Are there pockets of it? Of course there are, just like anything. But by and large, I 100% agree with you. And, uh, Mark comments, he says, in Australia, we have no COVID now. We, uh, we don't wear masks and they have stopped the stimulus payments. They need to stop those payments because like you, yeah. I have friends that run small businesses and I had lunch with a gentleman on Tuesday and he was said, you know, one of my best friends owns a restaurant and I think Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, he says, cannot find a dishwasher. He says, uh, I put an ad in the paper and I was willing to pay, let's say, $15, $16 an hour just to get a dishwasher. One person, after weeks of running this ad, finally showed up to an interview. And when the guy comes in, he's like, look, I'm going to be straight with you. I'll take the job, but I make $19 an hour right now through unemployment. And so can you pay me 19 and I'll I'll come to work. I just need to make what I make now. I can't lose money. And the guy's like, I can't, I, you know. I cannot. You know what? I give the guy credit for saying I want to work, but match what the government's paying me. The problem is this idea that the government has to give people money. You know what? This this may sound harsh to people. Don't deny someone their struggle. It's the struggle that makes us who we are. I started life out as a guitar player. I lost that ability through a health issue of tendonitis. I had nothing. I lived in a one room crappy apartment in Hollywood. I ended up moving to the valley because I could afford it. Um, got married, and we had a very tough time getting started. But it was through that struggle, you know, living on rice and beans because I couldn't afford other food. But it was during that time, that struggle that you really, that's what that's what made us, my wife, that's what made us who we are. And if the government had then had come in and just said, hey, guys, here's we're just going to give you money so you can buy better stuff, would, have I, would I have had the drive? to buckle down and sit there at my little cardboard box office making phone calls trying to sell print, you know, printer ribbons, would I have had that drive? I, I don't know. It's uh, I was forced into it, and I buckled down, and it worked for me. And I see it work for a lot of people. But they got to stop doing this. It's not, it's not the responsibility of the government to make sure Americans are okay. We as citizens make sure our neighbors are okay. And uh, – yeah, I, I absolutely love that sentiment, Tom. I, it's so funny we're having this conversation now. And I had this conversation with my youngest son last night. We were talking about, you know, visualization, having a goal, creating little steps to get to that goal. Every, you know, everyone, that everything that you see in front of you doesn't have to be an obstacle. It's probably a stepping stone. You just have to uh, rearrange the way you see it. And I think it's easy for uh, the younger generation now to look at, let's say, us and go, gosh, you know, you guys are successful and you have all this stuff and you do all this travel and everything looks real easy for you. And I I was telling my youngest son, I'm like, you don't remember you weren't born yet. When me and your mother were just starting out, we're a couple of poor kids. I got married at 18 and we lived in a trailer and we, you know, describing how it, what, how awful it was. And I said, but you can look now and we have 14 acres and three houses on our property and everything's great. We have rental properties everywhere and own these companies. I said, but, but never forget, like you said, Tom, if I hadn't had my self backed into a corner, like I've got nowhere to go, but up the government wasn't sending payments to, to our little trailer, you know, 25, 30 years ago. You know what I'm saying? No, it's, and it's, it's interesting. People don't realize this. The reason secure went into the consumer market is our military business, uh, you know, we were growing, went from nothing to about six million in sales just very quickly. We were growing like crazy. And then remember sequestration under Obama? They passed that bill where it was forced military cutbacks. Yep. When sequestration hit, my company went five months without a single order. I had a staff, I was making payroll, trying not to lay people off, but I burned through everything I had. We ended up laying people off. I ended up selling off personally assets my kids never knew how bad it was my wife and i did this was 2000 what was it 2008 2010 i came down i really close to, to being out of business I mean, really we got to a point where we were running out of everything 
and uh, we picked up a couple of small contracts, military contracts, and then we picked up another one. And I was down to, I think, a three-person company at that point. Again, and just we, we were a pretty good-sized company. And it's not that long ago that we were up against a wall, and I was at a point where I was going to be selling my house and just getting – like, it wasn't good. But it was, again – Nobody came in to bail me out. Nobody, I didn't even look. I just said, what can we do? We got to solve this problem. We got a couple of contracts. They were small, but they, they had enough to keep the lights on. And we made the decision, how do we keep this wild fluctuation with the military? We get three big contracts and we're hiring, we're going crazy. Then we don't. And we're, we're laying people off. So we looked at, that's when we went in the retail, the consumer market. And that's what triggered it. Once we looked at the consumer markets, our meeting with safe companies, we're like, holy cow, we got to change this industry. The safe industry is out of control. This is not how to store guns. And that's what really got the company to now we are on a trajectory. Um, you know, one of the fastest growing companies in America now. And it's being driven, it's driven by struggle, by us almost being out of business and not being bailed out, but being forced to make difficult decisions. No, I, I love that. And I, I echo Gerald's uh, comment here. It says, you are an American success. I hope you influence high school age kids. And I agree with that. But I try to. I've got one graduating this year. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a uh, it's awesome. And I, you know, Tony says they want power and control. I'm assuming he's talking about the government with with regard to supplying money. Because if you're so, it's just, it and then what's interesting is they they send you the stimulus check and they follow it up with a letter signed by the president. Like I just gave you this fourteen hundred dollars. So they're buying votes. It. They're trying to. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Oh, the one thing I do also want to throw out is. Please. Um, because of the beautiful artwork and lamp behind me, I just want all the listeners to know I'm in New York City right now. My son is graduating from college, so I'm uh, broadcasting from a, a Hyatt Regency hotel in New York. <laughs> well, it's a lovely background. Yeah, <laughs> Tom. Hey, Tom, uh, again, I've, thank you so much for the hour and 15 minutes I've had you on here so far. What final closing comments do you have for those that are going to be watching today in the replays in the weeks and months to come? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you. It's up to, as we are a nation of individuals, our constitution gives us individual rights and never forget that. And it's up to you as an individual to do the right thing. Um, owning firearms makes you safer if you do the right things. And that is train, get good instruction, practice, make sure your guns are secured, make sure that I mean, nobody has un, unwarranted or un, they're not accessible except by you or by those you authorize. And, uh, you know, doing it right is fun. Doing it right makes gives you confidence and makes you makes you safer, makes you a better person. Absolutely, Tom. And, and guys watching, please click on the links today and check out Sec Secure It Tactical Inc. as well as the – what is the retail line? SecureGunStorage.com. If people just Google Secure It, one word, the word mm -hmm. Secure It, we come up everywhere. Okay. Good. And I encourage each and every one of you to do that. If you're looking at your safe, like Tom said, and it looks like mine over here in the corner with everything kind of jumbled up inside there, uh, we can do better than that. And I want you to check out Secure It Storage. Tom, thank you for coming on today, sir. It has been an absolutely amazing show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys. Remember, stay safe because the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>